impatiently. So I had to go through with it and accept it just so people can see that I can not only dish it, but I know how to take it as well. And that's the only reason why I didn't get up and walk on out of there. As far as Eugene Crane goes, y'all gonna have to pray for our brother. He was the darkest thing on the panel, talking about he's an American. Yeah. Dang, I'm sitting over there, I'm speaking, I'm looking at him like, <laughs> and Lauren Burke, good God almighty. I don't know what's wrong with our sister, she also drank the Kool-Aid. But I'll be honest with y'all though, that panel was representative of a lot of the consciousness and thought in black America. Mm -hmm. Eugene Craig is not an isolated case. Lauren Burke is not an isolated case. And I really appreciated my brother, the attorney, for the words that he gave. Because I don't know if y'all peeped the way he was looking at them. But he looking at them like, where these coons come from? <laughs> you know, he looking at them like, damn, I didn't sign up for this. So I'm glad he kind of clarified his position. Although it was sad to have to hear my brother say that your rhetoric is so strong for those of us in the mainstream. You notice that? Mm -hmm. For those of us in the mainstream, it's sad that once you reach a certain place in life, you can no longer identify with those from where you come from. And so one thing I've always tried not to do, and it hasn't been difficult because I've never disidentified from the hood, regardless of all the degrees that I've gained, I've never gave up my hood strikes, my hood passport. And it's very important that those of you who got your second master's and your third master's and your doctorate, you never give up your passport to the ghetto because you never know when you need to call on the ghetto. You understand? Sometimes you need your brothers from the hood. I keep Tay Tay on speed dial because Tay Tay can do things I can't. John John can do things I can't. Little Rob and Man Man, they can do stuff Dr. Umar can't. So you got to make sure you stay loyal to the hood. So today, brothers and sisters, well, I just got invited to be on the Ricky Smiley Show Monday. So, well, I'm not clapping yet, damn it, because that, be, that could be rolling part two. Y'all clap and hold the claps. Let's see what happens. All right? So make sure y'all tune in Monday at 9 o'clock in the morning. The Ricky Smiley Show is coming Monday. Now, I just got on the phone with his producer. I said, I hope y'all ain't going to do another rolling. Nah, brother, we ain't going to get you like that, you know, but we might just ask a few things. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm still waiting on that Oprah phone call, though. Because if I get that Oprah call, I know we had that school in two weeks, you feel me? You sit on Oprah couch, she make you a millionaire overnight. Y'all remember the black woman? Oprah brought her on her show. Sister makes cookies, homemade cookies. Oprah brought her on the show. She wasn't ready for Oprah. She got millions of dollars worth of orders overnight and couldn't fill them. She lost out on her opportunity. Not me, because the GoFundMe is up and running, baby. So go ahead and bring me up on in. We're going to get the two billion for the school. You know, Baltimore, I was trying to put the school in Baltimore for the longest but we're not having a lot of luck finding available schools here that's for sale. So if you know anybody who knows somebody who owns a school here, let me know, because I really wanted to put it in Baltimore. Maryland is the state of my ancestors, but not only that, it's just two hours from my mother and my daughters in Philadelphia. So Baltimore would have been ideal for me, but I haven't had any luck finding these schools here. I have had some luck in other places, and I don't want to give them up yet, but I'm currently looking at some school sites now and if all goes well, we may have one before the fall, you know, but I'm still keeping my sights open. So if y'all know something in the Maryland area, that Baltimore, D.C. area that might be available, hit a brother up and let me know. But it looks like we're going to have to go a little deeper south. I'm, I'm getting better opportunities with schools a little bit deeper south, okay? So if we want to keep the first FDMG a little bit upper south, which is where we are now, then y'all gonna have to help me find some properties, okay? Now, today I wanna to talk about a very important subject. This is a presentation I did for the first time a couple years ago up in Harlem, New York, National Black Theater. I didn't get a chance to finish it. I attempted to do it in a couple other places, didn't get a chance to finish it. Finally finished it on the West Coast, I think I did, when I was in Los Angeles. 
but I never finished it on the East Coast. We tried to finish it in Atlanta a couple years ago. Brother Murdoch was there. And remember, all the lights went out. Couldn't finish it in Atlanta, so we're going to try to get through it today. This is called Anatomy of Strategy, Introduction to Military Science for Revolutionary Pan-African Nationalists. Now, you don't have to be a revolutionary Pan-African nationalist. You just got to be a concerned black folk. But what I do here is I go over some of the rules that white people use to control blacks. The rules that white people use to control black folks. And then after that, we look at some of the rules that our ancestors used to destroy white supremacy. Because we have this myth that we never be white folks. There's a myth that white folks just came into Africa, we just laid down. There's a myth they just came into Jamaica, they just came into the Caribbean islands, and black folks laid down. That's not true. That's not true at all. We have a very rich heritage of standing strong against racism and also defeating racism. But as you know, history is written by the victor. Mm -hmm. So whenever black people beat white folks, it tends to find itself out of the history books. So we want to take a look at some of those victories that our ancestors used and see if we can piece out the lesson in it for us today because I believe we can still use some of the same tactics of our ancestors to be successful against white supremacy. So, first thing we want to do is we want to talk about the definitions. Political science, and my undergraduate degree is in political science. What is political science? It's the study of the principles of non-physical combat and warfare that are used to take control of resources, control large masses of people, and defeat one's enemies. Political science is military science without the weapons. Von Clausewitz, one of the white man's greatest military generals, said what? Politics is a continuation of war by other means. Politics is a continuation of war by other means. So if the cracker was correct, and if politics is a continuation of war by every by other means, that means we have war 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. seven days a week. You understand that? Because ultimately, why is every war fought? Most wars are fought to do what? Dominate the resources. People kill each other to control the resources. You got a Cold War between who? China and America today. What is the Cold War about? Who's going to control the gas in Africa? Who's going to control the oil in Africa? Who's going to control the imports in Africa? Wars are about resource control. So when you look at Baltimore City Council, you look at the Maryland State Legislature, you look at Washington, D.C. Legislature, Virginia, Delaware, Pennsylvania, how many politicians who look like us can we say are actually carrying out war on behalf of African people when they go to work? How many black mayors can we say are really standing up for us when the conversation about resource allocation takes place? Black men are being hammered across America for what? Unemployment. Jobs are a resource. You know why black men ain't got no jobs? The reason black men ain't got no jobs is because jobs is a resource. And when you want to kill people, you do what? Keep as much of the necessary resources away from them. They're talking about Chicago right now. President Trump sending in his troops. Stop sending in soldiers and sending jobs. Everybody knows black men in Chicago have one of the highest unemployment rates in America. But why does that never come up in the conversation? Because nobody wants to talk about resource allocation. When do we get to the resources? So they tell black folks, Eugene Craig said, well, we came a long way. We had the civil rights bill. But what I had to remind Eugene Craig, the Republican Party refused to sign off on the civil rights bill unless the Democrats do what? Insert homosexuality in women as a protected category. So what should have been for blacks ultimately ended up being for gays and white females. Resource allocation. Let's talk about the next definition, military science. What is military science? It's the opposite of political. 
the study of the principles of physical combat in war that are used to take control of resources, control people, defeat enemies. Let's talk about strategy, tactics, and ideology. Now, we belong to the black consciousness community, right? We the Hotep family. Hotep! <laughs> right? Now, the problem with the Hoteppers, okay, our problem is all we deal with is ideology. You don't deal with strategy and tactics because strategy and tactics are used by people who are actually trying to do something. Let me say it again. Let me say it again. In the whole tech community, okay, all we talk about is ideology because you don't talk about strategy and tactics unless you're actually trying to do something. Ideology is the thought. It is the vision. It is the mindset. But it must be reduced to strategy and tactic in order to be effectively implemented. Are y'all following me? What the hell going on out there? Okay, light ray. Strategy. The objectives used that one believes, if obtained, will bring victory against one's opponents and fulfills one's political economic agenda. Tactic. The behaviors and actions Tactics, the behaviors and actions that lead to the fulfillment of the strategy. People say, Dr. Uma, I'm going to bring you up to New York for a debate. We want you to debate him. We need you to debate him. Brother said the other day, we need you to debate Michael Eric Dyson, the whole tech versus the integrationists. <laughs> for what? No matter who wins, have we won? What's the purpose of an intellectual masturbation session if there's no victory for African people? So ideology, the particular goal, vision, worldview, or system of interpretation that one uses to make sense of world events in their place within. If you're Christian, you have a Christian ideology. If you're a black Christian nationalist, do you have a black Christian nationalist ideology? <coughs> Hebrew, Nawapian, God and Earth, Nation of Islam, Pan-Africanist, Socialism, Garveyism, Marxism, all of these are ideologies. But none of them mean nothing unless you come up with a strategic plan of workable objectives and tactics. And until we get there, the black conscious community is nothing but another mega church perpetrating a fraud. Damn. I'm going to keep it a hundred. The black consciousness movement, as it is in the United States, is another T.D. Jakes operation. Good God Almighty. That brother that got his horn fixed. Damn. <laughs> and that's not to insult but it's to be truthful we want to raise the consciousness we want to wake brothers up we want to bring sisters into a higher understanding of their divine feminine essence <laughs> hotel and guess what that's beautiful but if the consciousness doesn't lead to any creativity, what good is it? Consciousness becomes like the religious doctrine. And in fact, I would argue that we use consciousness as a weapon more than Christians use their beliefs as a weapon. If I got to choose between going into a conscious set and a Christian set, I might choose the church. Because we are so judgmental and condemnatory within black consciousness, why would anybody want to join it? So when a sister walk in the room, her hair ain't natural. <laughs> right? First thing they said, she got in the wrong shape, butter! <laughs> Y'all know how it be? Brother walk in, he got on the wrong arm. Brother, your aunt ain't in the right place. Brother, you should know better. <laughs> Listen, our ancestors.
pastors did not get involved in the struggle just to learn more. The information was a means to achieve liberation. But today we've gotten to a point where knowing the information is the goal. You ain't got to build no schools. You ain't got to build no hospitals. You ain't got to establish no banks. You don't need no supermarket. Uh-uh. We don't need no community defense. We know all you need to do is become awakened to your oppression. Well, I got a problem with that because as a psychologist, I help people wake up every day to the consciousness of their drug addiction, to the consciousness of their pedophilia, to the consciousness of their low self-esteem, to the consciousness of their domestic abuse issues, to the consciousness of their bipolar and their borderline, to the consciousness of parent-inflicted poor self-concept. But just because I awakened you to the consciousness of your reality, does it change you? That's the first step. Knowing who you are, that's the first step. That ain't the end. We read a couple books and say, I'm free. Mm. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. You walk out, hey, I'm new. <laughs> Go get a blunt. <laughs> See, what I want y'all to understand is what we call consciousness is cerebral. It ain't spiritual, it's cerebral. Because you can't have a spiritual transformation and keep doing the same things. Are y'all following me? You can have an intellectual transformation because that's cerebral. So you can know smoking ain't good and still smoke. You know the consciousness of cigarette smoking and all the bad things that can come from it, but it's cerebral. You can go on contradicting what you know. But once you have a spiritual transformation, you can no longer smoke. And so the challenge for the conscious community is not just to intellectualize who we are, but to internalize who we are. And until we internalize it, nothing will change. Now, let's talk about the code of white supremacy. And these are not the only 11 laws, by the way. I'm working on a whole book. Code of white supremacy and a code of black supremacy. And when I say black supremacy, because I know some of y'all are like, damn, he is the black hit. Listen, <laughs> black supremacy don't mean black folks need to rule over anybody else. Black supremacy means we want to be supreme in ruling over ourselves. Do you feel what I'm saying, Ashe? Do you understand me? I don't need to rule Jews. I don't need to rule Caucasians. I don't need to rule over Arabs and East Indians. Uh-uh. When we say black supremacy, we're saying we want to be supreme over our own lives. Okay? I want to be clear about that. So how do white folks control Negroes all over the world? All over the world. I just came back from China a couple weeks ago. Brothers put me deep with a lot of stuff going on in China. And one thing they told me, they said, Doc, guess what happens over here if you get a Chinese girl pregnant and you don't marry her? They said, when black men get Chinese women pregnant in China and don't marry them, they end up missing. They said they routinely find dead black males, and the one thing that many of them have in common is they got a Chinese girl pregnant and refused to marry. Oh, yes. In China, they will make you marry her. That's right. Or well, they will take your life. Because they never wanted you touching her in the first place. But since you did it, you made your bed, they're going to make you sleep in it, or they're going to slice that throat. Oh, yes. Chinese are racist as hell. Racist as hell. The Japanese, not as racist, but still racist. And I ain't got to tell you, sisters, that all the brothers in China and Japan married the Chinese and Japanese women. One of the biggest things that the sisters brought out in the session that we had in Shanghai and Beijing and Tokyo, they said, Dr. Uma, we upset because all these black brothers you see in here, ho tepping with their aunts on, they all got Chinese and Japanese wives. They said a black woman can't even get married in Asia. That's right. And then y'all got mad at me because I said a black man need to be with black women. Some of y'all lost y'all damn mind. How dare he? You don't see nobody else fighting for the right to betray their own. Marriage is an economic decision. Marriage is about money. You don't believe it? 
Go to any divorce court. Do you see anybody dividing up? Love. <laughs> I want half my love back. Do you see that? I want half of my commitment back. I want half of my eye shade. Uh -uh. What they divide up in divorce court? Assets, bank accounts, houses, businesses. Marriage is an economic investment. When a black man marries a white woman, he's investing in her community. Period. Michael Jordan is a billionaire. He's investing in a white Cuban woman's family. Because when he dies, she gets the estate. Same thing for uh, Tay Diggs and Tiger Woods and Cuba Good Jr. Well, Tiger already done. <laughs> they caught him drunk driving. He can't stop thinking about that settlement. Should, and now y'all heard about RG3? RG3 white wife is getting a divorce. I think they already got the divorce or the separation. And she wants $36,000 a month for living expenses. Money stop. A white woman. He broke now. Because the coach for the Redskins messed his career up, brought him back too soon, so he'll never be the RG3 he was. So he broke RG3. And because he ain't the man no more, what the white girls do soon when you fall from stardom? They cut ya! And y'all calling the sisters the goat niggas. Ain't nobody goat digging like the white girls. <laughs> ain't nobody goat digging like the white girls. I love my brother Kanye. I love Kanye. He crazy. But he lost his mom, and I can empathize with that. I wish he would have came to me for some therapy because he ain't got nobody he can go to. Right. Right. He ain't got nobody he can go to to talk. He never got over his mom's death. Who can he talk to without it showing up on the front page of the tabloids? You're a clown. But I got news for my brother. You're ugly. And I don't want to tell him this, but 30 years from now, when he looking like Bill Cosby, what you think Kim Kardashian going to do when, 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 when uh, Kanye start looking like Bill Cosby? <laughs> Flabby and sick. She gonna cut out because you was nothing but a quick hustle. The black man is the white woman's economic stimulus package. Damn. The black man is the white woman's economic stimulus package. If you look, ninety percent of the time when they marry us, they marry up. When we marry them, we marry down. And this is why I say the only white woman you can get is the one other white men don't want. You a leftover lover. That's all you get is the leftovers. They should just put all the used white girls in the thrift store and let you come pick them out. <laughs> and I'm not disrespecting the white woman. She knows this is the truth. Rich white men don't marry down to poor white girls. Rich white men do not marry poor white women. But a rich black man will. Because for you, it ain't about status or class, it's about acceptance by your oppressor. Mm -hmm. So let's look at the rule. Rule number one, never let black people know what you're thinking. Intentionally mislead them if you must. What is the essence of military strategy? Deception. Mm -hmm. This is why white folks lie to black folks all day long. This is why they lie to you all day long. Mm -hmm. And you don't understand it because you're looking at them with your Christian values. This ain't about Christian values. This is about global domination. How do white folks think Africa? Deceiving you. How do they still keep Africa? Deceiving you. Now the Chinese over there, deceiving you. How do white folks keep control of Baltimore even though Baltimore is one of the most densely populated black cities in America? White folks still control the resources because they use words that deceive you. Words like multiculturalism. Can't we all just get along? Whatever happened to the human ideal? Well, if that's the case, there should have never been no damn slavery if we so concerned about humanism. White folks don't care about no damn human beings. There's rules to racism and you need to understand what they are. The first rule of racism is all white people are racist. Yes. The first rule of racism Hell is all yeah. white people are racist. Not some, not most, oh. all white people are racist. And you got to understand this. Come on in, family. All white people are racist. And at the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, we're going to teach the babies that all white people are racist. Yes. I'm not going to teach your children to hate whites. 
Why not? Because that's emotionalism. If emotionalism can save black folk, you'd be free already. <laughs> you'd be free already if emotion can save black folk. I don't just want to get your kids in a room and start telling them everything white folks done. They in they huffing them. <laughs> now I gotta give him some damn rhythm and the calm his ass down, some Adderall. Spray some concern on his ass. Uh-uh. <laughs> Let's go get him. <laughs> that ain't gonna get nowhere. I want them to intellectually overstand, understand, and understand his historical oppressor. Hating hey, white folks ain't gonna change nothing. I want you to understand white folks. And in order to understand white folks, you got to understand that they don't change. White folks are consistent. The white man behaves today the same way he behaved in the 1900s. He behaved in the 1900s the same way he behaved in the 1800s. He behaved in the 1800s the same way he behaved in the 1700s. He ain't changed. He has been consistent. So what excuse do we have for not being able to understand a consistent enemy? You know what your block is? And we're going to talk about this Sunday in D.C. Your blockage is your self-hate and your desire to be accepted by that which does not want you. Okay? I want to be very clear about this. Because this is the post-traumatic slavery disease. Okay? Now my good sister, Dr. Joy McGrew, social worker, she calls it a syndrome. I'm a psychologist. I call it a disease. Because it's contagious. Why do I call post-traumatic slavery disease contagious? Because your children catch the sickness from their parents. It gets passed down. Who passed down light skin worship? Who passed down dark skin de de degradation? Who passed down thin hair was better? Who passed down if you ain't got no Jordans, you ain't nobody? Who passed that down? That was learned behavior. Everything we do as African people was learned. Who learned it? Who taught it? Listen, you'll never get rid of slavery until you get rid of the slave impulse in the Negro psyche. What we do today, we'll be doing a thousand years from now if somebody don't change the way we raise our babies. You got to change the whole situation. Because see, some of y'all whole tempers think this struggle is about taking over from the white man and then imitating the white man's social life. Uh -huh. This was something, see, you want to kick the white man out the chair so you can control Mercedes Benz. Uh -huh. <laughs> you want to kick the white woman out the chair so you can sell the perm and I just wear it. <laughs> That's not this revolution. We desire a total transformation in reality, vision, principle, and outlook. We want to be in control, but we want to be in control of the right things for the right reasons. When I was in China, I had a brother tell me that he got access to weave and perm factory. He said, Dr. Umar, I got a whole setup. We can sell all the fake hair in America we want. I just need you to find some people to help me get it out. I'm not lying, it's on the video. I said, brother, that's against my principle. He said, but if they're gonna buy it anyway, why can't we sell it? Because it's against what the hell we supposed to be about. And that's another enemy we got in the black community. Damn. We got a lot of black capitalism disguised as black nationalism. Damn. Are y'all following me? Next time I hear a Negro say, help me get rich and then I'm going to help you get rich. How many of y'all heard that? Mm -hmm. Help me get rich and I'm going to come back and help you get rich. That ain't nothing but a damn hustle. Because we can get rich together. Why you got to get rich first? Why we can't get rich together? Because your ass don't plan to come back and say it. <laughs> Y'all know it's the truth. Who you know that came back? I'm going to move out to the suburbs and I'm going to come back and fetch you one. <laughs> Polite. They don't do that. So that's rule number one. White folks will lie to you on purpose. It's what they do. And see, the reason you have trouble understanding that all white people are racist is because you keep on judging white folks through your immature religious condition. Yes, all white people are racist. They might manifest it differently. They display it differently. They express it differently, but they're all racist. Brother told me his white wife wasn't a racist. I said, please give me a list of all the pro-black activities she's been involved in to systematically eliminate her white privilege and bring about equality for African people. He couldn't name one thing. Well, if all these white women love black men, then they should love all black people. 
So why they not fighting against police genocide? Why these white women they got a movement to fight against mass incarceration? Since they not racist, you should be able to show me something your white wife has done on behalf of black folks. See, this is where they get y'all. Every white person has a couple of black pet projects. Damn. Every white person has a couple of black pet projects, but what I need y'all to understand is none of those pet projects are designed to do what? Bring systematic change. What did I keep on asking Eugene Craig? Where's the systematic attempts? What did I ask Lauren Burke? Give me something systematically white folks did to level out the playing field for blacks. He said the civil rights, first of all, the civil rights bill was only about public accommodation access. That's it. Your right to access white institutions that cater to the public. That's it. That's not giving me no opportunity. What did Dr. King say? Dr. King said, what good is it to sit at the lunch counter if you can't afford to buy the bill? Do y'all see that? The civil rights bill got you to the you lunch counter. You already know you're telling the truth, man. <laughs> but there was never a movement to put you in a position to pay for your own meal. That's why you're supposed to be here, Congress. And that's what black people want. We want to be able to pay for our own meal. See, white folks get us because they keep on giving us what, y'all? Handouts. White folks love handouts, don't they? We got some welfare checks. We got some food stamps. We got some free cheese. I'm still constipated from that damn free cheese 20 years ago. <laughs> Had a free cheese steak. Damn. Right? Free cheese, free butter. White people love to give you stuff for free. You know why they like to give you free stuff? Because it keeps them in control of your access to resources. We want to feed the hungry, but we're not going to economically empower the hungry. Do you see that? You're still going to be hungry, but we're going to feed you. But we want to do nothing about the systematic steps that put you in hunger in the first place. Damn. Frederick Douglass said, so often black people, we strike at the branch. We know we want to strike at the root. We want to tear the root of racism. Because as long as you content yourself with the little trinkets, we gave you Obama, that's a trinket. Civil rights bill, that's a trinket. Voting rights act, that's a trinket. Freedmen's Bureau, that's a trinket. Desegregation, that's a trinket. I don't want no program. I want empowerment. Our problem is we settle for the program. Every day in Baltimore, we coming out with a new program to help single mothers. A new program to help angry black boys. A new program to reduce teenage pregnancy. We got a new program for ex-offenders. But do you notice all of their programs are designed to come into existence after they have already disadvantaged your life? And none of the programs are designed to empower you. Show me a program that empowers single black mothers. She can get a GED, but that's not economic opportunity. She can get into the community college, that's not economically opportunity. I'm not saying that we should be against it. I'm saying you've got to recognize when you're being played. Because all they're throwing out is a little tassel. They tell you, here, kitty, here, kitty, kitty, kitty. And you know, we go sniffing. <laughs> you got to say, uh-uh. I want access to America's wealth because guess what, black folks? The one thing we are entitled to that we never got is our share of America's wealth. That's it. That is it. We can walk off the plantation. They own everything. We own nothing. There was never nothing put in place to redistribute the wealth that we built for America. That's what we want. Redistribution of the wealth. Reparations is redistribution of the wealth. They want to give you the right to vote. Listen, if voting could change anything, it would be illegal. Mm. If voting could change anything in black America, it will be illegal. You're only allowed to vote because it is not a threat to the power structure. So what are you saying, Dr. Umar, we shouldn't use the vote? I'm not saying that. We can use it, but we need to be clear. Voting will only work if we vote as a block together and represent our special interests collectively. It must be a group action. 
As long as Baltimore and Maryland and Virginia and D.C., as long as y'all want to keep on voting y'all independent consciousness, it'll never change anything. Because a numerical minority must stand together if they ever want to have a chance against a numerical majority. It's unify and die. But there's only one problem with unify and die. Black people hate each other more than they hate racism. Mm -hmm. oh Black people hate you. There's nothing you hate more than yourself. That's right. The police who kill our sons, you hate them, but not as much as you hate each other. Have you realized our whole culture is based on conflict? Our whole culture based on conflict. Why do you like the reality shows? Conflict! Mm -hmm. Gangster rap. Conflict! Think about what you love to look at, you and your children. It's all about an appetite for destruction. That's our whole culture. Sports, conflict. Basketball, football, conflict. Everything is conflict-based. Because black people love to fight other black folks. And sometimes we try to hide the conflict behind fine sound and words like, let's have a debate. When all you're doing is thirsting off of black people's desire to see each other at each other's neck. Number two, always try to figure out what black people are thinking and planning so you can disrupt and capitalize on their genius. Stop telling white folks your business. The white person's job is to find out everything about you. You ever notice soon you get hired on the job? White folks surround you. you notice that? They surround you. Hey Rashad, how are you? Well, are you from Metro or the county? Got any kids? Ever been married? You smoke? Did you watch this morning? This is called information collection. That's military science. You got to know your enemy. And no white person is comfortable around a black person unless that black person is docile. So they got to make sure you identify with the power structure before they can baptize you into white supremacy. Yes. So what you got to do? You got to resist the urge to tell your business. With all due respect, I don't discuss my personal life on the job. Well, it's okay. Where do you live? With all due respect, I don't discuss my personal life. That's what you do. And they love to come over your house. Hey, maybe I can come over your house and show you how I make my favorite cake. Uh-uh. Right. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Can me and some of my homies come over your house and you show me how to make your favorite cake? Right. Take, take, Ray Ray and Pop Pops. <laughs> See, they love to come in your house, but they never come. Once you come in their house, they want to know everything about you, but they don't like telling you nothing about them. That's right. Think about all your personal business you gave out to your white friends and co-workers, and how much of their business do you know? You've been steadily running your mouth. You don't know nothing about her. He could be a damn card-carrying member of the KKK. And that's because we don't really care about white folks because we already know what they're about. We ain't got to do no inquisitive investigation. We already know who they are. But they got to find out where you are because white people have to locate Negroes on the spectrum of racial consciousness. Because all of us are on the spectrum of racial consciousness. Some of y'all got low racial consciousness. So at this end, you got Eugene Craig and Lauren Burke. <laughs> low consciousness. And then you got Roland two steps away with the owl cat on, whatever they call that shit. Then you come all the way over here. And at the other end of the spectrum, you got me. So white folks got to find out where you at. Are you a 25 percenter, 50, 75, 100? They got to find out where you at. Because white people have a history of controlling black folks. And they got to know who you are in order to control you. So you got to keep your business to yourself. They shouldn't know where you work and none of that. Especially if you're in a managerial position. If you are one up over them, the worst thing you can do is spit your business. Because they will find a way to manipulate you out of that position. I've seen it happen time and time again. Nothing worse than a black manager hanging out with his employees. And some of y'all get so tight with white folks because white folks play that psychological game. They get you to forget that you're black. I know what I'm talking about. Because some of y'all made that mistake and it's okay because we all do. We want to make mistakes for you. But you know how you get so deep you forget you're black like Bill Cosby? OJ, they forgot they were black. They think you never make it with white folks. Black is black forever. There's no indoctrination into the white reality. You're always black. But you have to remember that because their job is to make you think that ain't the case because if you can drop your defense, 
You'll start flapping your lips. Rule number three, always appear to be friendly and humanitarian. Never appear to be aware that you belong to or identify with the race that rules. White folks always say, what? What racism are you talking about? I'm not a racist. What are you talking about? I've never hanged anyone. What's this shit? My husband isn't even a cop. We marched against the police in Ferguson. How dare you say that? We were up all night. Black lives matter. <laughs> Right? And then you start feeling guilty, like, man, maybe this one is special. <laughs> right? This is right? After 400 years, you find one who's special. <laughs> you notice that? Every black person got one white person that you swear is unlike the rest. So let me ask you a question. If your one white friend is so different from all the others, why have they never told you what the others say about you behind your back? Damn. Damn. Y'all hear that shit? Because she might be special, but her mother not. Or her father. Or her cousins. Or her husbands. Or her next door neighbor. So if she is a special white person, why she doesn't tell you the special things that white people say about you so you can be prepared and protected? Because she ain't no different. And what is the job of the white woman? The job of the white woman is to do what? Psychologically disarm the black man. The white woman's job is to come in flirting and floating with that flat booty, right? This is her job, right? Right? Smell like cheese to us, man. It's right. And her job is to psychologically disarm you, all right? And then once you drop your arms, the white man come in with the axe right on your damn neck. And the white woman is brilliant. Remember Hillary Clinton was going around for Bill, had black men all open. They figured she was a cute white lady, so they was flirting with her. I'm glad she didn't win. Because y'all would have went to sleep worse than y'all slept on no bomb. That white woman would have won. She would have flirted with every black lady she met. They'd be crawling on all fours with a damn Hillary tattoo on their chest. The white woman's job is to psychologically disarm the black male, to infiltrate, gather the information, and take it back home to her man. Oh yes. Oh yes. Then we got number four. Look for blacks you can use to advance your cause. This is never difficult. Most of them identify with us anyway. Most of you have an American consciousness like Eugene Craig. He said, I'm an American. We move forward to Ghana. <laughs> you talking about the ruling Martin, you know? Thank God about you. I'm going to take you in the cottage. The child pledged the flag, they identify with America too. If your child is pledging the flag at school, then you're making a Negro. Because there's no way in hell you're going to go to school 180 days a year, 12 years straight, 13 for some. That's over what? 14,000 pledges of allegiance and you don't identify with America. That is ritual symbolism. And what is the purpose of ritual? The purpose of ritual is to condition the unconscious mind. And after you've engaged in the ritual of pledging the flag after 13 years, you feel like Paul Revere, your damn self. And that's why you shouldn't let your child pledge the flag and they don't have to pledge the flag. The U.S. Supreme Court had already said it's the right of a family as to whether or not they want their children to pledge the flag. I would never pledge that. But some of y'all got y'all sons hand over their heart, pledging to the same police department that took the life of Michael Brown and Trayvon Martin. You should be ashamed of yourself. And guess what? Because it's a right, you don't have to explain it. Did y'all hear that? Why aren't you standing? I don't pledge the flag. If you have any questions, you can call my mother. I don't pledge the flag. If you have any questions, you can call my father. It is a First Amendment freedom of expression protected right not to pledge the flag. And guess who you can thank for the law? The Jehovah Witnesses. It was the Jehovah Witnesses from Pennsylvania back in the 1940s, I believe it was, who challenged because they said, we only pledge to Jehovah. And they sued already up to the Supreme Court for the right for their children not to pledge the flag. So for all my Jehovah Witnesses, 
I want to thank you. But your Jesus in the watchtower is still white. <laughs> Number five, use religion to gain black people's confidence. They are religiously immature. Historically, whenever we endorse their gods, it opens up an opportunity for exploitation. They tend not to think clearly under the influence of religion. And most of them have a natural inclination to care about other people more than themselves. What did they say? They said the white man came to Africa with the Bible and we had the resources. By the time the white man left Africa, we had the Bible and he had the resources. And guess what? The missionaries are still operating in Africa to this very day. To this very day, the British and the French and the Roman Catholics, even the Arabs, send in their religious organizations. That's right to massage the consciousness of black folks away from being African towards being a part of a religion. And then they send in the AIDS. Then they send in the birth control. Yes, yes. Then they send in the hysterectomies. Oh yeah, to this day, religion is still being used as a weapon against black folks. I ain't against your Christianity. I'm not against your Islam. But you better be using it as a weapon for your people. As long as you Africanize it, I'm cool. Marcus Garvey was a Christian. Malcolm was a Muslim. I don't care how you pray or to whom you pray. But how you work and think in the name of that religion. That to be racially affirming to black people. Okay? You ain't got the comedic side of your life if you don't want to. Okay? You can if you want, ain't nothing wrong with it. But if you're going to be an Ankh, Tonk, Kanoon, Rock, and that side, let the shit be real, please. <laughs> okay? Let's go to the next one. Oops. Number six, always remember. No matter what black people say, keep your dignity. Never forget you belong to the race that rules, but never profess this as it is the mark of the politically immature white folks. White people are told to never act like they have power. Have you noticed every time you have a conversation with white folks, they try to act like they're at the same level you are? Yeah, Think about it. Yeah, white folks never tell you I know that I have privileges you don't have. Rarely do you get that. What they'll do is they will de-objectify themselves and say, well, most white people have privileges you don't have, and I'm just like you. My mother was on welfare. My daddy went to jail. Mm -hmm. They try to make it look like our struggle and their struggle are the same, but they're not. So you got to understand white privilege, and what's the first of all privileges white people have? The first of all privileges is the privilege to know that you ain't never got an answer to a black person a day in your life. Think about that, y'all. We answer the white folks all our lives. You answer the white judge, white doctor, white boss, white supervisor. How often do white people have to answer the black folks? And whenever they have to, you notice they go crazy. White folks can't take it having to listen to a black person. They lose their mind because it's not natural unless they're dealing with a coon and then it's okay because they know the coon is just a figurehead for the power structure. You gotta let white folks know, guess what? You, do you ever have to worry about your son being shot by the police? Even if it's past the sack. Even if he listened to gangster rap. Even if he got 20 inch rims on his car. The white boy ain't never got to worry about that. Do your son ever got to worry about being as unemployed as the black male? Does he ever have to worry about the skin that he's in being used as a social degradation mark? The poorest white person has more rights than the richest black person. Oh yes. And this is why black leaders keep on telling you, get an education and vote. Get an education and vote. Even here, should get an education and vote. Why do they keep telling you to get an education and vote? Because they want you to think that you can actually reduce the chokehold that white supremacy has on your life through a logical, nonviolent. 
But look at all the degrees we got. It don't make a difference. In fact, I would argue the more degrees you get, the more racism you face, unless you adopt a non-threatening, hyper-homosexual posture like a lot of black males accept. Y'all understand me? Okay? No, he might not be homosexual, but his etiquette, his presentation is very non-threatening in a feminine. Are y'all following me? Eugene, I'm an American, I'm an American. <laughs> no face in his voice or nothing, right? Absolutely no threat. I'm an American Republican, come on, on. Right? That's the type of black man they want. Nasal congestion. A nasally congested dick route. Okay? If you nasally congested like Eugene, you ain't no threat. So brothers, if you want to get a job, put some nasal in it. No, 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 no. You already know comments. When I go to the university, you know the main thing I got to tell the young brothers? I got to tell the young brothers to make sure you keep your swag. Because they socialize. They hated I'm that. telling you this through example, the more successful black men, they tend to parrot this hyper homosexual personification. So if I'm a college student and I look at the successful black males, I'm noticing none of them got swag. Best friend you should have came with me. It's very tight and thin and skinny and proper. And nasal humping with you. So brothers, keep your swag. Okay? Never invite them into your house unless it's necessary. If you can do a verbal altercation with blacks, try to provoke emotional reaction. You can't get emotional with Negroes, excuse me, with white folks, or the Negroes who represent them. I don't care how angry you are, never blow up at work. Because once you blow up, they're gonna exaggerate it and say that you threaten them. Because one of the biggest rules of white supremacy is to look at, is to look like you're being victimized by the person who you victimize. Are y'all following me? So your boss been mistreating you, your boss been calling you out your name, your boss been intentionally working against you, but the minute you raise your voice, they got you. Why so many black men are getting restrained on this being forbidden from going to their children's school again? Because you raise your voice. And the minute a black man sounds off and projects his masculinity, the white woman will automatically interpret that as an attempt at physical violence. You didn't swing, you didn't threaten, all you did was raise your base. And she said, I felt threatened. And now you're getting escorted out in handcuffs, can't go back to the school ever again, not even to pick up a report card. So you never lose your cool. White people believe in the written word because that's how they lie, with the written word. So you have to do exactly what they do. So when you got out that argument with your boss, you should have sent a letter to the boss and to the boss's supervisor. I just had an altercation. I was disrespectful. Beat them to the punch! But see, we be too lazy. Black folks, we be lazy. We don't like to challenge them with the written word because we got too much going on. You got to start documenting everything because that's what they do about you behind your back. Write it down! Always try to get black people fighting each other. Once they start fighting each other, it's difficult for them to stop. This is the most important strategy. They have a most unique fondness for destroying one another that supersedes all other interests. They love to get black people fighting with black people. That stunt that Roland Martin pulled, that was a classic example. On national TV, Negroes is going at it over how good white people have been. Because y'all know that was the topic of the conversation. White people have done well to us how dare you say that we should not consider them to be our spouses? Okay? To get black people fighting over white folks. This is why they love. Back in the Malcolm X interview, same thing Roland Martin did. They put Malcolm X over here, they have James Farmer over here. To get the blacks going at each other, hopefully they'll forget about the enemy. Can no black person really be your enemy? They can be your adversary and your adjective, but they can't really be your enemy. Okay, they're just a representative of a power structure that they don't thoroughly understand. 
Which is why you got to control yourself from getting too angry at Negroes. Because they sick. And if you work in a mental health hospital, you don't get angry if they throw, throw something at you. You say they're mentally ill. The black community is a walking psych ward. And you got to be careful when you travel amongst us because some of us are dangerous. Which is why I be careful before I tell black folks to get away from white folks. Because some black people will kill you if you try to get them away from white folks. By <laughs> Eugene Craig, nasal. Oh, Come oh, man, he's not going to anymore. If you're able to provide material support to blacks or their organization, this is certain to triple to all the reverence they have for white folks. This is about getting financed by white folks. Now I'm a Garvey. Pan African nationalist, we do not take money from other races. We don't. You heard Roman. What Roman say? Why you ain't open up a charter school? You know what I'm You know what I'm saying? 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 You can collect the money. How much you got? You collect. What? No, you can't. Charter schools are owned by the state. You don't own them? They're going to tell you you got to have a certain amount of gay teachers, a certain amount of white teachers. Your kids got to pass the graduation test. Homosexual curriculum. What the hell I want a charter school for? I want to own what I'm doing. Nasally decongested ass. <laughs> but see, white folks want to fund you. I had white folks reach out to me. Yes. You're so awesome. <laughs> I mean, I'm not offended by a thing you say, Umar. <laughs> America needs to hear it, and I know you probably have your beliefs about white folks, but you know what, David? We deserve it. <laughs> I have a way that I can get your school funded in less than three months. If you will just work with me, I promise you, FDMG, we can do this together. <laughs> and then I gotta let them know, I don't trust you, like you, or need you! <laughs> White folks love to fund black people so they can control you. That's why they funded the NAACP. Control you! When Barack Obama got elected the first time, did you know the NAACP spent over $10 million on voter registration? $10 million on voter registration? $10 million on voter registration? Who in the hell needs $10 million to fill out a free form? You don't pay to register to vote, but the NAACP spent $10 million. They could have opened up a bank, a hospital, supermarket, school, put some people to work. Effective re-entry program for brothers and sisters coming out of prison, but instead of doing anything worthwhile, they spent their money on voter registration. That's why white people created it to give the illusion to black people that they're actually leading you out of oppression when they're just <laughs> driving you in circles amongst the oppression. Urban League, mm -hmm. yes. No major black organization can take money from white folks and claim to be sincere. Now let me clarify. Because some of you are probably saying, wait a minute, Doc, I get some money from the state. I got a program for little girls. I got a program for boys. I got an after-school program. I'm not knocking you. Do you? Because what you have is a special interest program trying to help a certain population. I ain't got no problem with that. What I'm talking about is when you say that my organization is the vanguard in the forefront. You understand? We fight for political, economic, social equality, but we're being funded by white folks to do it. That's a contradiction. Because white people only fund black people to control black folks. Keep it all black. Last, never reveal the code to black folks without knowledge of the code. They'll never see us as a unified group of exploiters. And that's the key. White folks are unified in their exploitation and oppression of black folks. They're unified. They act like they're individuals, but they are unified. But you're not unified. White folks know black people can't stand each other because they're the ones who taught us not to stand each other. They taught it. They know exactly how we think. They know that you have more compassion 
for outsiders than insiders. A black person do something to you wrong, you'll never forgive them the rest of your life. Yeah. A white person can do the same thing 10 times over again, and you'll keep on accepting them back. You've been shopping at that dirty Chinese store all your life. You showed up two pennies short. And what did mama's son say? Two cents short, you not buying. Me hold till you come back. Tell me I'm wrong. The snow be 10 feet deep. Mama son, I need this iced tea for my grandma. I need the weed. Then fried gives it. Mama son, but my nickel, my man, my nickel. They never let you go. Do you curse out mama son? Nope. nope. Get that nickel when you come on back for that dirty iced tea that look like gas oil. <laughs> and them dirty chicken wings. And y'all know they ain't never throw the chicken wings away when they old. They will cook 1980 chicken wings. And you pull the chicken wing out, it'll even look like a chicken wing. It look like a damn ham. <laughs> you eating somebody's thing, it ain't no damn chicken look like that. You see a chicken look like that. Talking about maybe that's the way they cut the head off. You know what they told me in China? They cook dogs raw in China. Oh yeah, they said you can walk, you can ride down the road. I didn't see it, but they said, oh yeah, they will cook the dog right in front of your face. And they said one of the biggest problems in China is that they steal people's dogs and cook them up. <laughs> no, I'm not lying. They steal people's dogs in China. So if you have a dog, you can't let your dog outside because they will steal it and that will become a Thanksgiving turkey. <laughs> And if you don't think some of that dog meat ain't ending up over here in your chickens, then you got something wrong going. When I was in China, they eat all kinds of stuff. Octopus, squid, turtles, all type of stuff was in there. I didn't know what to eat. I just had eggs every day. <laughs> Mama, son, I need some eggs. All right. Now let's talk about the white supremacy handbook, rule one. I'm going to speed past this because I'm going to get to the ancestors. The information strategy. Overwhelm black people with, this, with insignificant and useless information. Overwhelm black people with insignificant and useless information. And I'm gonna say that the black conscious community is partly guilty of this. Because we got so much information coming at y'all all day long. Half of it is absolutely useless to moving us from where we are to where we need to be. Is the black woman God? <laughs> Yeah, she if is. she is, or if she ain't, it ain't changing our reality. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Are there aliens living under the earth? It might be, it might not be, but what is it doing for us? In fact, if they're not coming to help us fight white supremacy, I don't give a damn about no aliens. What are they, are they, what are they doing for black folks? See, you have a lot of people who specialize in distraction. They don't want to deal with the real problem. They want to entertain you to death with all types of useless information. And that's when you've got to ask yourself. Every time you turn on a video, come to a lecture, how does this benefit us as a people? Or is this just more intellectual masturbation? Yes. Out of every 100 videos on YouTube, only one is actually relevant. But some of y'all like spacing off. Y'all love beaming up the sky. Well, you know, Barack Obama was really Malcolm X's son and all type of crazy stuff like that. Y'all love that kind of stuff. <laughs> y'all love that kind of stuff. The Mandela effect. Y'all love it! Ain't no solutions in it, but you love it because it's very entertaining. When are you gonna realize that revolution ain't entertaining? If you're one of those black folks who will only pay attention to something, if it keeps your attention, you're in trouble. Because there's a lot you got to read that's boring. There's a lot you got to do that you ain't interested in. Mm -hmm. One thing I can tell you about this freedom struggle that we got, it will be anything but entertaining. Rule number two, so that's useless information. The one man, one vote. Keep black people thinking individualistically. Because they're so engulfed with notions of freedom, you need only substitute the concept for the construct. Make them think having a vote is more important than anything else. What they tell you in election time? Just vote. You say, what am I going to get? It don't matter. Your ancestors died for it. Don't y'all hear that every day? Hell yeah. 
Hell yeah. But we've been doing this for 100 years. It doesn't matter. Your ancestors died for it. See, the black bourgeoisie needs the black vote in order to keep the trust of the white power structure. So if you don't vote, they lose their job, and the white power structure is going to get a whole new Negro elite. So they got to get you out voting to show that they still have your confidence. See, whenever you vote, that's the message to America that I still believe in your ability to change. That's a message to America. I still believe in your ability to change. Like I said, if all of Baltimore are going to come together and block, if voters are block, all of D.C. going to come together, voters are block, all of black America will come together, voters are, voters are block, we can get some things done. But don't let nobody convince you that voting is a solution or way of life. Voting is a what? Tactic! Nonviolence is a what? Tactic! Dr. King never said it should be a way of life. It was a tactic, something he used when he existed because he thought he would achieve the strategic objectives that the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the, and the Civil Rights Movement set out for. Stop turning tactics into ways of life. Sometimes you gotta be violent, sometimes you gotta be nonviolent. Sometimes you need to vote, sometimes you need not to vote. Are y'all feeling me? Mm -hmm. Tactics, yep. not ways of life. Some of y'all walk around with a Bible and a vote. <laughs> And neither one of them rescue black folks yet. Say that again. Confusion strategy. Be sure to provide assistance to the blacks while you are destroying the blacks. This is powerful. We're going to help black people while we kill black people. Let me give you an example. Who are the number one gentrifiers of the black community in America? And y'all live in D.C. and Baltimore, so y'all should know the answer to this. It is the colleges and universities. That's how they get black folks out of Baltimore. That's how they get black folks out of D.C. That's how they get black folks out of Virginia. The colleges and the universities are the number one real estate owners in America. Did you know that? The colleges and the universities are the number one real estate owners in America. If you want to get black people out of Baltimore, you know what you do? You go to the college and you say, listen, and they'll even use the HBCUs if they got to. Howard. They'll say, listen, we want you to open up a clinic for single mothers in the ghetto of Baltimore. We want you to open up a daycare center for poor black boys in the ghetto of Baltimore. We want you to open up an Afrocentric library in the middle of D.C. And why do they send the colleges in? Because most people don't feel comfortable fighting against education. Most people don't feel comfortable fighting against education. So whenever you want to take something from black people, do it in the name of education. And what you're not paying attention to is as they expand in your neighborhood, they raise the property values. So they're slowly pushing you out of your neighborhood because grandma was on a fixed income. They know how much grandma can afford. And where the colleges go, the property goes up. Why do you think all these colleges are opening up charter schools? Every college in America wants a charter school in the ghetto because they care about black kids. Hell no! Raise the property value, bring the white who you thought was for black kids, ends up being all white. Deception is the essence of war. My so whenever somebody uh, comes to you talk about a charter school, you better go to the meeting. Who's taking out this charter application? Well, I'm the spokesperson. I didn't ask you who the spokesperson was, because that's going to be a nigga. That's going to be nasalism. No, 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 I'm here. You don't want him. Who took out the application? Because they love to get a black spokesperson. You want to know who took out the application. Because if it ain't black folks who took out the application, we're protesting this charter school. <coughs> See, what y'all need to understand was never supposed to go for the charter school hustle in the first place. What was we fighting for in the 60s? Community control, baby. Y'all remember that? Community control. Some of the elders, y'all remember that? We wanted control of the schools that our children attend. But guess what happened? White folks said, we can't let Negroes control. So this is what we gonna do. 1990, we gonna come up with a charter school. Something that looks like they control it, but we have the final say. And so guess what we did? We gave up community control, and we went for the charter school movement because thirsty, greedy Negroes realized that if they open up a charter school, they can pay themselves a lucrative annual salary. Y'all follow me? In other words, Umar Johnson was fighting for community control of Baltimore schools. 
But then the mayor pulled me to the side and said, they said that if you apply for this charter school, you'll get it overnight. I said, damn, let me go over here. I could call myself the CEO, pay myself $100,000 a year, never even show up to the school at all, hire another principal to run the school, and guess what they tell me? We give you this charter school, we don't ever want to hear you talking that community control of the school stuff again. And if you do, we will frame you and lock you up and say you were stealing money from that charter school. Oh yes! Why do you think all these black charter schools get shut down in America? Three reasons they shut down black charter schools. Number one, financial mismanagement. We couldn't find $5 in your account, so you're going to jail. You don't have enough certified teachers. That means you ain't got enough white folks in your school. And number three, your test scores are too low. That's right. We want to put you in corrective action. You didn't make AYP. You got two years to get your test scores up. If you don't, we're going to take the charter. They just did it to an Afrocentric school in Philly last year. They just did it to one of the oldest Afrocentric charters in Philly. They go on now. White folks came in and snatched their charter. That's why I don't want no damn charter school, because white folks own it. For y'all children, half the time our kids didn't even fail the test. They just said that they failed the test, because you're not there when they score them. Number four, 